Hey everybody, welcome back. I know you've already gone over this a little bit in class, so this is just a quick review of the last part of Chapter 4, Winds and Pressure. So by now, you should have reviewed this video, video 4.2. There's two sections to that, which covers the basic pressure zones of the planet and the wind zones and how they are associated with each other. As a reminder, we've talked about the pressure zones such as the ITCZ, or Intertropical Convergent Zone, the Subtropical High, the Subpolar Low, and the Polar High. And as you can see, we have the Subtropical High, we have the Subpolar Low, and the Polar High in the Southern Hemisphere also. We then also identified the major winds, and we saw that the names are basically which direction they come from. So we have the Northeast Trade Winds coming from the Northeast, blowing between 30 North and the Equator. We have the southeast trades blowing between 30 south and the equator, converging at the ITCZ. We have the prevailing westerlies blowing between 30 and 60 degrees north and also 30 and 60 degrees south, generally coming from the west. And then we have the polar easterlies blowing between 90 north and 60 north and also 90 south and 60 south, generally coming from the east. So you need to know what, what is associated with these various pressure zones and wind zones, which direction they come from. Are they representing sinking air, rising air, or horizontally moving air? So I have a few pictures here, such as this one. This is um, within the ITCZ. So just some kind of things to look for if you're in those environments. So you'd expect to see warm air rising near the equator and giving us a lot of cloud cover because warm air can hold a lot of moisture. As it rises, it releases that water vapor in the form of water droplets. So we get a lot of clouds and a lot of rain. So the equatorial area is generally quite warm and quite wet. Well, the trade winds are usually windy zones located between zero and 30 degrees north and south. And in the time period before we had mechanized methods of travel, we would rely on trading goods using these wind patterns, hence the word trade winds. This is, sorry, <coughs> excuse me. The subtropical high pressure zone would be indicative of sinking air, high pressure sinking air, and our great deserts are found around 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, where we get uh, clear skies, sinking air, and generally areas not that far away from the direct ray of the sun. The westerlies are a zone of winds located between 30 and 60 degrees north, 30 and 60 degrees south, with the prevailing wind blowing from the west. Subpolar low, located close to 60 degrees north and 60 degrees south, and this low pressure area with cooler air is going to give us misty, drizzly conditions, very much indicative of maybe the coast of Alaska, maybe the coast of Norway, places like that. The pole easterlies, that zone of winds located between the poles and about 60 degrees latitude, so 90 north to 60 north, 90 south to 60 south. And here we see winds going around and around and around. Lots of Coriolis force at those latitudes. And the winds going around and around coming from the east. And finally, we have the polar high, both in the North Pole and the South Pole. Well, the North Pole is basically occupied by an ocean, the Arctic Ocean. So a submarine such as this one can poke out through the ice. And here we are at 90 degrees north with a frozen sea, basically, and clear skies because that air is sinking. Now, we could not get a submarine to the South Pole because that's a continent there. And of course, it'd be pretty hard for a submarine to get there. One thing of note, um, this will become very important in later chapters. Between 30 and 60 degrees north, the same in the Southern Hemisphere, by the way, but we have the zone of the westerly winds going around and around and around from the west to the east. And at 60 degrees north, average position, we have the sub. So that subpolar low will be located about 60 degrees north latitude. And we measure that at the ground. So if you go up in the air above the subpolar low, about, let's say, 40,000 feet, there will be a river of air that goes around the planet from the west towards the east, goes around and around and around and around. 
and that river of air is called the polar jet stream. That will be very important later on when we talk about the development of storms in our wintertime. Now, if you looked at the diagrams that we've been drawing the whole time, around the equator, so across the equator, we should see the ITCZ throughout the year. However, if you recall, the direct ray of the sun migrates all the way to 23 and a half degrees north in June, and then back to the equator, and finally to 23 and a half degrees south in December, then back to 23 and a half degrees north in June, and so forth. So back and forth, back and forth. That's a direct ray of the sun, the subsolar point. Now, all of the zones we talked about, the ITCZ, the subtropical high, the subpolar low, they will all migrate a little bit with the sun. So if the sun goes into the northern hemisphere, all of these zones, including the ITCZ, will migrate into the north a little bit. The average might be 5 or 10 degrees away from the equator. But if we get large continental land masses like Eurasia, we can see that this ITCZ zone gets displaced quite a bit further away from the equator. In the southern hemisphere summer, the ITCZ moves a little bit further south. So we kind of tell a fib when we say these are always at zero degrees for the ITCZ. That's about the average position, but it will move with the seasons. And that will become important to us when we look at chapter seven and climate zones. Now, we also have to deal with not just um, our regional or global wind systems, but also our localized wind systems. And the ones I really want you to know, to tell you the truth, because this is a physical geography class, not a weather class, I want you to know about monsoon winds, about land sea breezes, and Santa Ana winds. Those three are the most important. So that's what I'm going to spend the time on in this review. So monsoons are winds. Again, first word there, winds. Winds that reverse direction with the seasons, bringing heavy summertime rain and dry conditions in the winter. So again, winds that reverse direction with the seasons, bringing heavy summertime rain and winter dry conditions. Now you can see over here, we have two seasonal conditions here. And this is for South Asia, which is occupied largely by India. And we can see that the Indian subcontinent, and in fact, much of Eurasia, will warm up in the summertime because of the strong rays of the sun hitting around 23 and a half degrees north latitude. So this land heats up. Remember from our earlier in the chapter and from our last chapter, land heats up a lot faster and a lot more so than does water. So the land heats up, the air above it heats up, and that air will rise. Well, that's going to pull air in from the Indian Ocean. That air will warm, it will rise, it will kick out its water vapor content in a form of water droplets form clouds and lots of rain. And this will go on for months at a time. So if you're in maybe this part of India, if you get to May, June, July, August, and September, you'll be under pretty cloudy, muggy, quite warm, wet conditions. And that rainfall is referred to as the summer monsoon rains or the monsoon rains. Some people just uh, associate monsoons with only that portion, that summer portion, that rainy portion. But to be honest, it has to have a seasonal fluctuation in the wind pattern as well as the rainfall pattern to be a true monsoon. So this is a summer pattern here. The winter pattern is the opposite. And you think about as the sun's direct rays have migrated south of the equator, they're somewhere over the Indian Ocean where it's warming that water up and that air will warm up and rise and rain over the ocean. It will split and sink down over what is now, let's say in January, a very cold landmass of Eurasia and the Indian subcontinent. So the air will sink, give us clear skies, no rain, and actually cooler conditions. Then that air will warm up, rise, and form clouds and rain over the ocean. So for India over here, it's a very nice time to visit. It might be a bit chilly up in the mountains, but a really good time to visit would be let's say October, November, after the rainfall. December can get quite busy there, can also get quite chilly. Then you get into maybe late January, February, March, April, also a very good time to be in India. After that, the monsoons come again as we approach summertime. So 
Um, if you ever want to visit there, I would highly suggest you visit during the late fall, into the winter, and into the middle of spring. So the reason I talk about India in this case and South Asia in general is that this is the area we really do associate with the monsoons more than any other. Again, here's that summertime condition, moisture coming from the oceans to the land, lots of rainfall. Wintertime, air sinking over the land and they're moving downhill, giving us clear conditions. So this is the, uh, a map of the area of the world that experiences the most monsoon conditions. So all of this region here. So we're looking at, well, we have been looking at the middle portion of this, even though it extends into Africa, all the way over to East Asia, even down to Australia. The middle of this region is South Asia. So basically India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. These are the areas we associate more than any other on the planet with the monsoons. That's what it can look like. This is what it can look like in the summertime in parts of India and even the foothills of Nepal. Basically, very wet conditions, and because a lot of trees have been taken away from the land, from the uh, landscape, uh, a lot of mud flows, debris flows, landslides, etc., and they can be quite devastating. Not a great time to go to, especially the slopes or the the uh, foothills of the Himalayas in northern India. Now, on the other hand, if you go in October, November, or maybe January, February, March, it's a beautiful time to go to northern India or Nepal. So this is one of my favorite parts of the world in that time of the year. Unfortunately, most of us are in school that time of year. So when you do get a break in the future, go visit Nepal. It, it, needs, uh, it needs the income from people to come and see, and it's very much worth it because it's pretty inexpensive once you get there. Lots of stuff to do. All right, a very similar type of wind pattern, but not on a large region, more of a small scale. Any place that has a coastline will probably experience this land sea breeze system. So we break this down into a sea breeze and a land breeze. And always keep in mind, breezes and winds should be named where they come from. So here we see a sea breeze coming from the sea to the land. This happens during the daytime. So during the daytime, the land heats up much quicker, much more quickly and much more extensively than does the water. Remember, water can mix. Water takes a lot of energy to raise its temperature. So it has a high specific heat capacity. Basically, this in the daytime is not going to, this ocean is not going to warm up quite as much as what this land will. So the land heats up, the air above it heats up, again, through things like conduction, convection, and re-radiation. The air heats up, the air rises. The air will only go so far, and then it's going to split. As it splits, it's going to come back at higher elevation across the water and sink down to complete that cycle, or convection cycle here, convection cell. So air rising over the land and sinking over the water. And this breeze will get strongest when the difference in temperature between the land and the water are the greatest. So that's typically middle of the afternoon when we get our highest temperatures over the land. So we can get a pretty strong sea breeze in the afternoons. And you think about that, if you've gone to the beach during the daytime and you have a Frisbee and you want to throw a Frisbee and have it come back to you, you pretty much have to throw that Frisbee towards the water to have the breeze catch it and bring it back to you without having to go fetch it out of the water. Now at nighttime, things are cooled off. Remember, the, the uh, coolest time of the day should be right around sunrise. So in the early, early morning hours, the land has cooled off way more than what the water has cooled off. So remember, the water doesn't heat up that much. It doesn't cool down that much. The water takes a long time to heat up, a long time to cool down. The land, on the other hand, takes a little bit of time to start warming up and doesn't take very much time to cool down either. And it will cool down extensively so that in the early morning hours, the land surface could actually be colder than the adjacent water surface. You might have experienced this if you've ever gone to the beach in the early morning hours, that the sand right by the water can feel really cold in comparison to the water itself. So the relative difference seems that the waters retain the heat where the land did not. And that's going to allow for a mild breeze of sinking air coming over the land or sinking over the land, moving over the water and then gently rising and doing a similar pattern to what we had 
during the daytime, but in the opposite direction. So blowing from the land towards the sea, that would be called a land breeze. The air would then rise very gently and sink over the land again. Okay. Now, as you can see in both of these diagrams, one is during the day and one is during the night. So you need to remember, sea breezes during the day, land breezes at night. Sea breezes can be pretty strong. Land breezes tend to be pretty mild by comparison. Now, depending on how high this air rises during the daytime sea breeze and how much moisture is kept in the air as it rises, we may actually get precipitation from that or even cloud cover. So basically, this is showing a sea breeze during the daytime. The air is rising. Since there's moisture in there, it could give us clouds. It could actually give us a little bit of drizzle, depending on many conditions. And the last wind I want you to be familiar with is the last of the local winds would be the Santa Ana winds. So Santa Ana winds are always associated with high pressure, remember sinking air, in the Great Basin. Now the Great Basin is basically the portion of the Western states centered on maybe Eastern Utah, sorry, sorry, Eastern Nevada, Western Utah, maybe around Great, the Great Salt Lake. So somewhere out here, if that's the center of the Great Basin. Because we have, mount, we have the Rocky Mountains out to the east, we have the coastal ranges in the Sierra Nevada off to the west, we have the transverse ranges making a southern border here. So basically, this is a high spot surrounded by high mountains. So we've got a basin, a higher elevated flat area with mountains around it. And that's going to mean that air can get trapped in this area. So if we have sinking air, so the air is sinking right here, it's trying to go out and bend to the right. It's trying to go out and bend to the right. Remember that anti-cyclonic motion, outward clockwise spiral. Hits the mountains over here and gets funneled this way. Hits the mountains over towards the south, gets funneled this way. Ultimately, it's gonna get funneled through these little gaps towards Southern California. And this can happen, these trapped air masses in the Great Basin can occur largely in the fall, winter, and spring. And we are really concerned about the ones in the fall because as this air is funneled towards Southern California, it gets faster, it's compressing, it's getting hotter, it's getting drier. And in the fall, we already have dry conditions out in the Southern California region. So you imagine that air is sinking, getting warmer, coming through these mountain passes, heading down towards LA. If our brush is dry, and if we get a spark on that brush or down power line, or somebody throws a cigarette out of a car window, catches that brush of fire, that's a recipe for disaster. So we associate the Santa Ana winds, especially those in the fall, before we start to get our wintertime rains kicking in. These wildfires can go crazy. And in recent years, we see more and more of them late in the fall and even into the beginning of wintertime. What makes the fires worse? When we got fast winds, like those generated by the Santa Anas or generated by that high pressure in the Great Basin. When we have low humidity, and remember as air compresses, it's gonna get warmer, it's also gonna get drier because even though warm air can hold a lot of moisture, if there's no moisture there, the relative humidity gets very, very low. And finally, high temperatures. So in the fall, we get those high temperatures, we get the low humidities, we've already got dry brush, we get the fast winds, all we need is a, need is a spark and things can get wacky out of hand.